This is going to be a transportation episode. We are going to talk about two transpo-related stories. One tragic, one not so much. Happy, maybe. Yep, the first is going to be on the brutal, alleged rape and murder of a DD passenger, and the second on the state of electric vehicles in China. Did you hear? Tesla took the first step towards opening up a factory in Shanghai. Hi everyone. We are Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily, powered by the Seneca Podcast Network. We're a new weekly podcast focused on bringing you the most interesting, relevant, and buzzworthy headlines in China tech. We're a part of Pandaily. dot com, a new English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Ray Ma, and I live in San Francisco. And apologies, but I'm a little sick today. And I'm your other co-host, Ying Ying Lu. We'd like to give a shout out to some of our fans. And please excuse me if I do mispronounce your name. Tane Jaipura, Elliot Ng. Amos Wittenberg, Yen Smigel, Hai Ching Yang, we love you. All right, let's dive right in. So the first story is the Didi murder. Ray, I know you researched this pretty deeply because you're headed to China tomorrow. So what happened? Well, I wanted to know if I should be using Didi when I'm there. So I did a lot of research, but I think I'm pretty safe. Why is that? Well, first off, we do have to acknowledge that a 21-year-old flight attendant named Miss Lee was raped and killed on the night of May 5th on her way from work in the city of Zhengzhou. Her presumed killer committed suicide shortly thereafter. She took a DD Shunfengche or hitch, basically short for hitchhiking. Yeah, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing, and also why I think I'm probably safe because this is a separate business from what we typically think of as ride hailing. Okay, I think I know where you're going, but before we go there, let's do a brief overview for our listeners, some of whom may not be as familiar. Didi is China's Uber, and in fact, acquired Uber China's operations in August 2016. It was founded in 2012, has raised a total of 20 billion dollars, and has a valuation of 56 billion dollars. It's also rumored to go IPO later this year at 80 billion dollars, or something like that. It has most of the same functionality you would find in Uber or Lyft, and has options very similar to Lyft Line or Uber Pool, Uber X or Uber Black. It's a massive company and the de facto leader in ride sharing in China. Yeah, so back to Shunfengche. That's an option mostly for car owners who have a long daily commute and so want to make a few bucks without going too far out of their way. The service is thus very cheap, but also requires the rider to book in advance. Right. So this DD hitch function allows the driver to see the time, the start and ending points, and decide whether or not to accept the ride. Yes, that's because it was designed for the traditional concept of commute carpooling, as we have said before. Why did DD launch this service, though, and how does it make money? Okay, so let's answer how they make money first. It seems that they take about a ten percent platform fee, as opposed to more than twenty percent for the other options. That's good, but the order total is also lower, right? Because the rides are about fifty percent cheaper, so they probably don't actually make that much money. Well, until they go public, we really won't know. What we do know is that there aren't that many full-time drivers in China. Sure, maybe there are hundreds of thousands, but there are a lot more regular drivers—two hundred million or so car owners, most of whom I would assume don't want to go through the tedious process of becoming a DD verified driver, but probably won't mind picking up a friendly face in the neighborhood on their way to work. So Didi created this to get people to become friends and be neighborly. Well, I'm sure that's not the only reason. But if you go back to all the marketing in 2015 when they launched the service, there was a heavy emphasis on transportation social networking. Not that different, if you ask me, from Lyft's original strategy, where you were supposed to chit chat with your driver and have a good time while getting wherever it is that you needed to go. Yeah, I never know if I'm supposed to talk to my driver or not. Well, in this DD hitch scheme, you are definitely supposed to. There are lots of anecdotes floating around on the interwebs about people striking up real friendships from these rides, some even becoming roommates. And guess what? If you are an untalkative driver, you may get a one-star rating, which may take you forever to make up. But friendships aside, we now know that for this supposedly friendly but definitely cheap option, 
Dee Dee didn't have the same procedures for driver verification as their other options. Yeah, that's right. According to the paper dot cn, which is part of Shanghai United Media Group, the reporters found that as of May 11th, Dee Dee still has ridiculously lax rules on registering as a hitched driver. Right. The reporter found that to register as a driver, the platform requires you to fill in details about your vehicle and then upload two documents. One of these is a driver's license, obviously, and the other one is similar to what I would probably call your car's registration. Sounds secure? Not really. Get this: the reporter selected female for gender and then uploaded a male driver's license. The system actually detected it, but didn't seem to care and approved the driver. That means it's not really checking for anything; just a valid ID. Yeah, people are saying DD should at least require a live photo of the person holding their ID card next to their face. Instead of just a simple document upload, that's actually something already required by many Chinese internet companies, and is at least a little bit more secure. Well, Didi does have other options to verify the driver's identity, such as facial recognition, Sesame Credit verification, which is kind of like your credit score, and your professional certificate. But these were apparently optional. Yeah, we can tell because in two hours, the reporter. Despite never submitting any of those materials, received a text message from DD saying that he had been approved and should start hitting the road. Yikes! So that's really no verification at all. Nope. But before you delete DD from your phone, the verification process for their non-hitch drivers is actually pretty intense. Like, like you can't have weird colored hair, visible tattoos, or communicable diseases. You must have a clean criminal, drug, and mental health record. Your car also can't be older than six years or be visibly damaged. It can only be certain colors, and you must have been driving for at least three years. That sounds pretty substantial. But why did Didi go so wrong then with the hitch option? I mean, this girl even texted her friend that her driver was a perv after she got in his car, and she didn't know that he'd gotten complaints before. You know, I don't know, but the public commentary has been that in trying to make this hitching service into a social experience. DD went somewhat overboard. Hey, you know those tags you can use to rate your driver on Lyft? Safe driver, good conversationalist, stuff like that. Well, apparently DD lets its shrimp phone drivers tag their riders, but the results are pretty disgusting. Yeah, I saw screenshots of that. Apparently, the drivers can see the rider's age, profession, and photo. But more than that, they can tag the rider as pretty, sexy, rides alone, or even a bunch of even more sexually charged terms. And these are visible to other drivers, who can then take them into consideration when deciding whether or not to take on the ride. More than that, DD also allows the driver to decide just to gift the ride. The initial thought was, if the driver and rider really hit it off, the driver can just hit a button that says, "Never mind, this ride is free." Offline social networking. Didi was especially proud of this, actually, even issuing a report saying that male drivers were twice as likely to give the free ride option to a female rider than to a male one, and that the most frequent free rides occurred between 10 and 11 p.m. Yeah. So now imagine you're Miss Lee looking for a ride. You might have already been tagged as very pretty and rides alone by previous drivers. Your driver is super creepy, but you just quietly text your friend and don't say anything because you're a poor twenty-something and you're hoping by being nice and sociable, you may get a free ride. Of course, we're not saying that's definitely what happened because we really don't know. But the product, for sure, had some design and execution flaws that made it easier for such tragedies to happen. And this wasn't the first murder. A female teacher was also murdered in Shenzhen in 2016, also taking a DD Shun Feng Chuo. Well, the reaction this time has been swift and fierce. When DD offered a reward for the killer's whereabouts, people thought that was lame, insincere, and irresponsible. They're demanding that DD make real amends, and the company is voluntarily shutting down its hitching option beginning May 12th, and promises to revamp the product. What do you think? Do you think it's DD's fault? Well, yeah. Like we said, I think there's a basic level of responsibility here that DD should bear in screening for drivers and designing the product in such a way that it doesn't encourage bad behavior. I'm not saying that male riders aren't also at risk, but the types of tags that were allowed and the comments that these hitch drivers put in the back end put female riders in disproportionate danger. Yeah, I have to agree with you there. It was a great violation of privacy and personal dignity. 
While I can understand that initial plan was to have the ride experience be more social, it's simply not okay to be ogling over riders and posting about their sex appeal. And way more intensive background checks need to be done. Here's to hoping Didi fixes it fast. <music> Breaking live update here. Literally, as we were recording this episode, Didi has released a formal statement addressing the very issues we've just identified. Titled our Phase One Safety Enhancement Plans, the blog post mentioned that all tags will be eliminated, driver facial recognition will be required for every hitch trip, and even that the hitch service will be inoperable between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. every day. The post also talked about overall changes to DD services, including a new "quote unquote" zero tolerance policy for matching driver and vehicle IDs. You can find the full document under Press on DD Chuxing's website. We think it's a good start. At least they're recognizing that these unfortunate events might have been a result of poorly designed app incentives. What do you think? Let us know. <music> Last week, China announced that it would allow foreign new energy vehicles or NEV car makers to take full ownership of their local ventures. This is a big concession on the part of the government, which is quite strict with every other industry, including fossil fuel-powered cars. It won't be until 2022 until that industry opens up. Right, and very soon after, on Monday, Reuters broke the news that Tesla had set up a new wholly owned company in Shanghai. This new company, called Tesla Shanghai Co. Limited, was registered on May 10th. This means that Tesla is much closer to producing its own electric vehicles in China and to establishing its very first gigafactory outside of the U.S. Tesla stocks were up 1.2 percent on Monday. Good for them. So the focus of this new company in Shanghai will be the development and services of electric vehicles, auto parts, energy storage facilities, and even solar panel products. Nice. Tesla already owns 24 stores, over 100 supercharging stations, and over 300 regular charging stations in China. It's actually one of only three non-Chinese EV brands for sale in China today. The other two are Nissan Leaf and Denza. Yep, Elon has been keen on China for a while. As early as 2014, he even exchanged emails with our very own founder, Kevin. He asked Kevin for advice about where he should locate his charging stations and who he should speak to to make progress for Tesla in China. So this is a major dream come true, even if it's just the first step. But Tesla should know that it has dozens of Chinese competitors in the making, even though Beijing has basically taken away the safety net and decided to let the strongest win. Most of you know about Tesla, but what about the other Chinese homemade brands? And there are plenty of them. In 2017, Chinese brands accounted for 96% of the roughly 700,000 electric vehicles built and sold in China. The major companies include BYD, Beijing Electric Vehicle Corp, Zhidou, and Shanghai Auto. After subsidies, and there have been really generous subsidies, the five best-selling EVs, three of them retail for under $10,000. So the typical Chinese EV is a low price, a low range, and low speed. I'd like to add here that there are many new EV challengers, such as Neo, Byton, Iconic, WM Motors, and Xiaopeng Motors, or XPENG, as they call themselves in English. Yeah, China has more than 50 EV startups. I got the chance to meet and spend quite a bit of time with the co-founder of Xpeng or Xiaopeng Motors, which is the current leading EV startup. The company is literally named after one of the founders, He Xiaopeng. He was an angel investor in the accelerator I used to work for. The last time we met was in the middle of last year, while he was here in the valley on a massive hiring spree. This is a man who is already an established entrepreneur, probably best known for co-founding UC Web, a browser company, back in 2004. UC Web was then acquired by Alibaba in 2014 in an undisclosed deal, supposedly worth four billion dollars. Right, and when we spoke, it was probably less than one month after he had officially left Alibaba to work at Xiaopeng full time as chairman, and here he was already hiring for technical talent. I just checked our WeChat records, and looks like it was the week of September seventh. Man, Chinese entrepreneurs really do move fast. Yeah, so here is a company formed by founders who essentially have no background in creating electric cars or running EV companies. 
And yet, because of the team's background in founding previous companies, they were able to attract funding from folks like Alibaba, of course, GGV, Shenhui Matrix, Morningside, and IDG, all really top-notch Chinese VCs. Wow, what an incredible list of backers! And they're already past Series C and have raised the equivalent of over 700 million U.S. dollars. When we asked He Xiaopeng what he thinks about this current change in regulation, he didn't really want to comment. He's cautious because he's not a native English speaker, and also because he doesn't want to comment on his greatest competitor, Tesla. China is the world's largest market for EVs. With the government pushing this market, the number of vehicles is expected to nearly 10x between now and 2025 to 7 million units. And it's worth noting that though we've focused on Chinese and U.S. brands here, there are a lot more players in the market. Folks like Japan's Toyota Motors have announced plans to produce EVs in China around 2020. They've also got plans to make hybrids and to produce more core components such as batteries. BMW has also talked about plans to produce an electric SUV and to release it in China before anywhere else. Then we've got Volkswagen, which has stated plans to invest 18 billion U.S. dollars in China by 2022, which is more than 40 percent of their total investment globally. The money is flowing. Ying Ying, I know you have some opinions on how this will play out. Yeah, my verdict is that these new EV makers, especially the younger upstarts such as Xiaopeng and even BYD, are not to be overlooked. I hope that we've been able to drive home here that Tesla is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of major players and innovators. While I really like Tesla and think that they have beautiful design and a powerful vision, I do think auto is one of those sectors in which Chinese innovation, so to speak, has an excellent shot. Especially if you're going for wider adoption by the masses and not just looking at the high end of the market. To really go big, local market knowledge and alliances here are key. That's again not to say that Tesla and other makers won't lead the pack in people's minds, but they might not be the top manufacturer, especially in driving mass EV adoption. And the big thing in all of this is that China really has a chance to become the world's first all-electric vehicle ecosystem. You know, we're used to thinking of all the major cities in China as being super polluted, but China has promised to meet air quality standards by 2035, and it knows it needs systemic change. The fact is, China's auto industry as a whole is quickly turning all electric. That's right. That stat we gave you at the beginning about the 700,000 all electric cars manufactured—that's actually more than the rest of the world combined, and it's growing faster than the rest of the world as well. We could really have an entire series of episodes about the details of this phenomenon, but let's just say that perhaps government-led growth in this area will continue to be a boon. As it stands, China is a leader in both the supply and demand for EVs, and I think that's why, from the perspective of the government, lifting some of these restrictions and allowing for more competition is ultimately a good thing for the country and the population, and definitely the air, even if it means greater competition for domestic players. <music> We'd like to give a shout out to our partners at Sub China. In addition to our podcast here with Pan Daily, they publish the Exila Seneca podcast, a weekly discussion of current affairs on China with journalists, writers, academics, policymakers, and business people. So while we only focus on tech, they really give you the entire overview. Sub China, hand in hand with GGV, also publishes the GGV 996 podcast, which interviews top tech leaders in China tech and investment. Han, Zara, and team are phenomenal, and we are big fans. Have a listen. Okay, that's all for this week, folks. Thanks for listening. We really enjoyed putting this together, and are always open to any comments or suggestions. You can find us on Twitter at the Pan Daily, T H E P A N D A I L Y, and my personal Twitter account is Rayma. That's spelled R U I M A. And my Twitter is spelled G I N Y G I N Y. We will be back here same time next week. Tech Buzz China by Pan Daily is powered by the Sinica Podcast Network. PanDaily dot com is a new English language site that tells you everything about China's innovation. Our producers are Carol Yin and Kaiser Guo. 